Bath of Georgia and Cedar Creek, New York. Um, but I feel that we in Massachusetts are really blessed with the representation we have in both houses of Congress. So these issues don't go away, although 
this guy who wrote this book, he's gone away. The, the one point low in market who I really miss is gone. But the issues remain the same. And so I introduced the nuclear freeze resolution in the House with uh, Silvio Conti in February of 1982. Uh, and Ted Kennedy introduced it with Mark Hatfield in February of 1982. And then I just started to gather co-signatories. Just this kind of crazy grassroots movement. By June, we had one million people in Central Park, the largest single demonstration still to this day that has ever been gathered around any issue in American history. That happened in the blink of an eye. It came out of the grassroots. It's what you today represent in terms of the power of this issue. We need to go back and say, how do we not agonize, but how do we organize uh, around uh, the issue of the use of nuclear weapons in our country, especially since there is a trillion dollars worth of new nuclear weapons on the blueprints of the Pentagon that the um, Armed Services Committees in both houses are like rubber stamping. It sends a message to the world that the United States uh, is still under the misimpression that these weapons are usable, uh, that nuclear wars are fighting. So we thank you for everything that you are doing just by being here today. Uh, and that nuclear freeze resolution ultimately passed on May 4, 1983 in the House of Representatives by a 278 to 149 final vote over 53 hours of debate with Tip O'Neill, who I asked to be the final speaker, saying this was one of the great debates in the history of the House of Representatives. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we must have again at this point. In a way that ensures that the American people understand what the consequences are of not paying attention to President Trump and what is going on in the Korean Peninsula right now. So it's my great honor to be here with my great friend and partner, Jim McGovern. If you Google the word peace, Jim McGovern's picture comes up. And this man is just absolutely unbelievable, committed uh, every day, insistently, persistently, consistently to raise the issues of peace in the United States House of Representatives. So we thank you, Jim, for everything that you do.
which in normal times is bad enough, but we all know we are not living in normal times. Okay? Uh, we have a president uh, who uh, actually talks about uh, this issue of fire and fury being uh, descended, uh, being dropped upon the North Korean people. And people say, well, it could all just be bluster. And that's true. It could have been bluster uh, that he was going to try to repeal the Affordable Care Act. But it wasn't. It could have been just um, a, a positioning game that he was playing before he pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. But it wasn't. It might have just been a way to try to renegotiate the Iran nuclear agreement before he decertified it. But it wasn't. It might have just been a play before um, he named Scott Pruitt as the head of the EPA. But in fact, the effort there is to turn EPA into every polluter's out. <laughs> on every other promise that he's made, he's been good on his promises. And so we should take him at his word here and not assume that it's just possible. Assume that since there are no exceptions thus far, uh, although there was a brief moment when uh, on DACA he was saying that he would support allowing these dreamers to come into the country, but his base very quickly disciplined him. He backed away extremely rapidly from honoring that commitment. So we have a great responsibility. Uh, we have to ensure that this man who is the president understands that there is a massive counterinsurgency which is now building across our country because universal because unilateral first use by the president would directly contravene the intent of our founding fathers. They specifically designed the Constitution so that no one individual would ever have such unconstrained power. Instead, they gave Congress the sole and exclusive power to declare war and commit the U.S. forces to offensive military actions absent very specific circumstances. And in many ways, the Congress has abdicated this responsibility. But we cannot abdicate this responsibility when it comes to a single human being deciding to launch and begin a nuclear war without coming to the elected representatives of the people of our country. That is the debate which we now must have in our country. Because it is vital that the president have the clear authority to respond to nuclear attacks on the United States, our forces, or our allies. But that does not mean that any U.S. president should have the power to launch a first use nuclear strike without congressional approval. Some theorists will say that restricting so-called first use weakens American deterrence. But that simply is not the case. The United States has the world's most powerful conventional arsenal and the most powerful nuclear response capability. We do not need to threaten a nuclear first strike to deter others from launching attacks. In fact, there are dangerous downsides to maintaining a first use posture. If adversaries believe that we may go nuclear, we create the very pressure that encourages them to build nuclear arsenals and keep them on high alert. The risk of inadvertent <coughs> nuclear war has risen to a level that is simply unacceptable. And that is why I have introduced, along with my colleague, Representative Ted Lou of California and Jim McGovern of Massachusetts, uh, legislation that makes crystal clear that Congress must check the President's authority. Critics of this bill will try to argue that it will limit the President's powers to defend the American people and our allies around the world. It will not. Under Article 2 of the Constitution, the President may repel sudden attacks as soon as our military and intelligence agencies inform him of such an attack. Unfortunately, 
we do not have the luxury of relegating this issue to theoretical debates. This week, Secretaries of State and Defense appeared before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. In that hearing, I asked Secretary Mattis if he could contemplate the President ordering a nuclear first strike in the absence of a nuclear attack on us. He responded that such an attack would be possible in the case of an imminent attack. But then the next question is, whose definition of imminent is going to be used? If it is Donald Trump's, uh, as we have heard on the earlier panel, and there's a homogeneity uh, that engulfs his advisors, then this definition of imminent ultimately becomes something that winds up with his closest advisors deferring to the president himself as he determines. And that is why we need a national debate on this issue, because the ambiguity on its own is caused for great concern. And the debate is taking place in the midst of a war of words with North Korea that could very well turn into an actual war. Which is why I asked Bob Corker, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, to have a hearing in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on first use of nuclear weapons in the United States. But we are going to have that hearing in 10 days. In Answering 
Congressman Liu sent a letter back to him last week. Here's what the answer from the Pentagon said. It said, the only way to locate and destroy with complete certainty all components of North Korea's nuclear weapons program would be through a ground invasion. That's the Pentagon. Last week of October 2017. The weapons would be deeply buried, scattered throughout the country, and our soldiers would have to fight their way across the country under threat of chemical and biological attack. Number two, we would face China on the battlefield. China does not want to fight the United States. But if we start a second Korean War, Beijing would have to fight. They don't want us on their border. In 1950, China fought with only a fraction of the military capability, confidence, and regional ambition it has now. Worse, according to, again, an October 2017 Rand Corporation study, even an initially localized conflict with China could quickly spread into the economic, cyber, and space realms, doing considerable damage to both sides. America, once again, would be flung into a full-fledged military campaign. Conflict between the world's two biggest economies risks the specter of a global economic meltdown. And three, the post-conflict reconstruction would be cost costly and very difficult. A post-conflict North Korea would make the occupation of Iraq look easy. There is no country on the planet more isolated than North Korea. No state is less prepared to reintegrate into the modern world. We could well face a North Korean insurgency fueled by a population brainwashed to believe that America is its mortal enemy. Once again, Americans would not be viewed as liberators. General McMaster said that we, quote, are running out of time with North Korea. But I want to speak very plainly here. We must not rush to war. We must not make the calamitous error of sparking widespread war with a first strike, nuclear or otherwise. That is the challenge our country is facing right now. In these times, it is imperative that the United States reassert itself as a world leader by using all of the tools at its disposal, not just the threats of military force. There is far too much at stake. To protect ourselves, our allies, and humanity itself, we must continue to tighten pressure on North Korea, coupled with robust diplomatic efforts. We must be builders and not destroyers. Instead of unleashing fire and fury, we must construct stronger international sanctions that, one, cut off the flow of oil from China into North Korea. Two, stop the Kim regime from selling the slave labor of its people. Three, eliminate Pyongyang's illicit drug trade. Four, halt its procurement of key rocket fuel chemicals. And five, end its use of the internet and cryptocurrencies to commit cyber crime and evade sanctions. But pressure alone is counterproductive. When Donald Trump applies pressure while publicly dismissing the possibility of a diplomatic solution, he makes war more, more likely. A successful diplomatic strategy must combine the pressure of even tougher sanctions, especially the cutting off of oil, with talks that convince Kim Jong-un that we do not seek to decapitate his regime. If Kim believes that the goal of our pressure is to overthrow his regime, as was the case with Saddam or Gaddafi, we would inadvertently encourage him to use his military capabilities in a last-ditch effort to save himself. We must assure our allies and our partners of this as well. Beijing, for example, fears a flood of refugees into China in the event of a North Korean collapse. But in 2006, China cut off the oil to North Korea 
And within a few, year, few, few weeks, North Korea came back to the six party talks. That can work again. And we must continue to work with our allies, South Korea and Japan, to strengthen our collective ability to deter and defend against North Korean attack. This multifaceted approach of pressure, diplomacy, and defense is the only way to avoid disaster. The current trajectory will only lead to an ever more threatening North Korea or an increased chance of a U.S. first strike. So, we come back to this hearing in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 10 days, where witnesses representing each perspective will begin to speak to each of the senators uh, of, uh, about the uh, options which are available and what could <coughs> trigger uh, a use of nuclear weapons. What is the definition of imminent? What should it mean? How should senators and members of the public understand the definition of imminent? We need this debate in our country. And the more that we have the debate is the more concerned people are going to be across the country because they do not want, in my opinion, to reserve the definition of imminent to Donald Trump. Okay? They want this definition to be well understood because it is their children, it is their uh, young people who will be ultimately at risk if the wrong decision is made. So this could not be more timely. Bill, Perry, Bill, Bill, Perry, Bill, Bill Perry recently wrote, quote, it is distressingly easy to imagine scenarios in which miscalculations lead to catastrophic consequences involving casualties that could climb into the millions. Congress is a stimulus response institution. There's nothing more stimulating than millions of people emailing and faxing and Facebooking and calling into the United States Congress. That is how you get change. That is how you get people interested in an issue. And so that's going to be our challenge. And everyone will say to you, well, you are not an expert. The people don't know. But just understand this, congressional experts is an oxymoron, like jumbo <laughs> shrimp or Salt Lake City nightlife. I mean, there is no such thing. The experts are the same experts that in 1982 rose up with the nuclear freeze movement. They are the people who stood up and say, we have a right to ask you questions, Mr. Expert. You have a responsibility to answer to us how these weapons are going to be used. So this is the time, this is the place, and once again, it comes to Massachusetts. It comes to the people who are in this room. We have to begin to organize intensively to make sure that we have co-sponsors on our legislation, but that all across the country, in town after town, uh, that these petitions begin to be gathered, that politicians understand that this issue must be debated that the consequences could be catastrophic. The president doesn't even intend, it looks like, in exhausting all of the economic sanctions uh, which could be imposed upon the North Koreans, coupled with diplomacy. We have to pressure them in order to accomplish that goal. So you are, once again, the historic figures. It comes to us, Massachusetts, to begin this effort. And it can spread just as fast as it did in 1982. It was the blink of a political eye, and it was a shock to Washington to the salt one, salt two, X.